Jimmy Neutron video game series was really all over the place. There was good games, bad games, mediocre games, weird games. From the clunky junk to the surprisingly polished, it has been one hell of an interesting dive. But you know we haven't divin' deep enough until we've covered all of those Game Boy Advance games. Yeah, all four of these games each had a Game Boy Advance counterpart, all of which were very different from the respective PC and console version. I actually grew up playing one of these, so I've been kind of curious seeing what the other ones all looked like for a while now, so I got my DS capture kit all set up at my desk there to do some Game Boy Advance recording. I got every single Jimmy Neutron game I could find for the thing. So, why don't we blast through all these guys and see what they're all about. Alright, first up we got Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius, the movie game. Okay, we got THQ and Humansoft, uh, not to be confused with Human Entertainment, which is the developer of Clock Tower. These guys aren't Japanese, no, they're a small studio based in California, and they were, uh, yeah, just your usual mid-2000s licensed game developer, worked on a number of Nickelodeon games, Wild Thornberries, iCarly, and of course, Jimmy Neutron. Okay, no title screen music, all right. Oh, there it is, and we get a cool little transition, panning down Goddard to the menu screen. That's really cool, actually. Well, literally three seconds in, and I can already say this is more well put together than that PS2 version. Oh my god, I will never forget how bad that game was. They didn't cheap out on the music, either. It's not just a short loop like the console version's terrible title theme. No, they cover the full version of the entire theme song, and as far as Game Boy Advance standards go, it's not half bad. Oh, yo, we can enter codes? Okay, I got it, I got it. This has to work. There's no way this isn't gonna be a... Oh, well, eat my ass then. Okay, let's try the tutorial stage, I guess. And, oh, wow, this... This is such a Game Boy Advance ass tutorial stage, you know what I mean? There's just something... There's just something really charming about seeing in-game sprites of the console you're playing on. I always really love seeing that for some dumb reason. But, uh, yeah, it's a side-scroller, kind of what I expected. You got a standard jump, you can duck and crawl even, okay. Shrink ray for your attack. Controls are not half bad. Movement is, uh, pretty linear, physics wise, I mean, like, you don't have to worry about your momentum or anything like that, it's just tight and precise. Uh, if you played Mega Man or any of these games, you know, it's more like that. Jimmy also has his jetpack, you'll have to find it in that level before you'll be able to use it there, just stand beside it to fuel the thing up, and then you'll be able to fly around with the L button until you run out. And again, the controls on the thing feel pretty good, throttling it to keep yourself level and maneuvering around all feels really great. It's pretty fun to play with, I have to be honest. Oh, and apparently you can also play as Goddard in this game. He controls more or less the same as Jimmy. You got the duck, the crawl, the beam, the jump, the jetpack. But the one thing that makes him a little bit different is that he has a grappling hook. By holding down the R button and pressing A, you'll launch this little rope straight upwards. Mashing it when there's nothing to latch onto above you looks kind of weird. Like, the animation doesn't really convey what's happening very well. I was really confused what this was even supposed to be at first. But if there is a ceiling above you, you'll latch on and you can swing left and right. Or you can stop yourself from swinging to reel yourself up and down Mission Impossible style. I would do that to avoid enemies a lot. He was pretty cool. Actually, swinging on the thing is kind of slow and clunky, but you can pretty easily just spam it to go forward, so uh, while it definitely could feel a lot better, it does still work well enough and never really gave me any issues. I guess Goddard also technically has a stun ray instead of a shrink ray, but while the animation is a little bit different when you hit the enemies with it, it is functionally the same thing, just renders enemies unable to harm you for a few moments, same as the shrink ray. You can also use the beams to break any blocks that may get in the way or blow up any explosive obstacles like floating mines and stuff. I love popping off those quick shots, like, uh, right when something enters frame. Yeah, like that! Jimmy out here making me feel like Mega Man, dude. One last thing unique to Goddard is this hedge clippers attack he can do. Unlike the beams, it'll actually destroy the enemies rather than just stunning them, so when you're not playing as Jimmy, it's a little bit easier to deal with all those Yokians. Anyway, that's the controls and stuff. Let's do a new game. Oh, medium, I guess. Oh, oh god, okay, okay. I promise this looks a lot better on the actual little Game Boy screen. Below and pixels up sometimes does not look very flattering, especially when they're like crunching down artwork to fit on the cartridge. Every one of these screens looks like a total frickin' mess on the capture card, so uh, if something looks kinda busy and ugly and terrible, just keep in mind it was meant to be displayed on a tiny little screen like this originally. Oh no! Aliens have abducted the parents of Retroville! We get a text retelling of the events from the movie, explaining that Jimmy has to find all the parts he needs to quote-unquote save the day. In other words, inventing the spacecraft to chase down the Yokians. Oh wow, you know what? 
this is skipping even more of the movie than it did on console. This scene that we're opening on here is more or less 43 minutes into the movie. But I guess it is at least a lot less confusing an intro than it was on console. Why do both of these skip so much? I guess the PS2 version does start a little earlier, but it drops you in front of Nick at Retroland with no context at all. At least here they had the decency to get you up to speed and then give an actual reason why you're looking around. Unlike the main side-scrolling gameplay, the hub areas are all played overhead. You'll be able to walk around freely and look for all the levels, and once you beat them all, you'll then be able to move on to the next story beat, and by extension, the next world. For some weird reason, the first world doesn't go over any of the scenes from the movie at all, but we do still get to see many recognizable locations from it as we look for the invention pieces. You got Jimmy's house, the park, the school, and of course, Retroland. After we get all that stuff, we then hop in the rocket, take off, and get this Mode 7 high-speed shoot 'em up stage. It's okay, it's fine, doesn't really overstay its welcome, and you only have to do it a couple of times in the game just between worlds, so it's more of like a, a cool transition thing than it is that annoying minigame, you know what I mean? It's all close enough to the movie. They more so wear the scenes as backdrops to each level instead of really following the plot, but it's a Game Boy Advance game, so I guess it's a fine way of doing it. The goal of each level is to find and collect all of some object. It's really just a collect-a-thon, you know, get everything and then find the end of the level. One of Jimmy's friends will be standing near the beginning of the stage to let you know exactly what the item looks like. Man, when I first started this game, I really thought it was all gonna be a huge pain in the ass, like finding everything and then getting to the end, but the level design ended up being weird good and like balanced like the variety here is actually pretty decent the timing of when you get the jetpack is always different some levels you have it from the start and you're flying all around from the beginning some levels they give it to you at like an interesting point and it eases the backtracking and opens up that last one or two things you got to do the levels even all have these little hints at the start letting you know what you got to look out for it's actually kind of cute almost feels like the developer was kind of proud of the stage they made and were excited about the thought of somebody going through it almost wanting to be like hey dude you know what you got to do for this one? And hey, honestly, it is level design I wouldn't blame somebody for being a little bit proud of. There's a very good through line in each stage. I feel like, despite being sort of open-ended, I never have a very difficult time tracking down every item because the level design is just consistently good at nudging me in the right direction. And I think a really big reason for that is the levels aren't all that long. Like, the biggest maps in the game will probably only take about a minute to backtrack all the way through. After you're done in the Yoki in prison, it's on to a final fight with Poltra. It's the same as the other spaceship levels, except here you just gotta grab the brain control helmet and throw it on her. There's really nothing to it, and it can pretty much be over in three seconds if you know what to do, but I'll at least give them points for making it somewhat accurate to the movie. I am actually so surprised at how good this game is. Like, the controls are good, the level design's solid, the pacing's pretty great. I think, honestly, if I had this thing as a kid, I would have been perfectly satisfied with it. I gotta give them props, Human Soft did a solid job. Easily my biggest gripe at the game, though, is the camera. It is so slow. It tries to lean in the direction you're facing to show you what's coming, you know, combating that old GBA screen crunch, but it needs to snap into place faster than this. I have to keep stopping to let it catch up. It was a constant minor annoyance. Only other thing I'd say isn't really all that great are the graphics. I mean, like, they're fine on the tiny little Game Boy screen, I guess. It looks like a reasonably accurate representation of the setting and characters, but... Dear Lord, when Jimmy looks at the camera with those soulless void eyes. Why is that something they have in common? Speaking of character faces, they did a really great job with this one here. Poor Nick. Some areas are also really drab looking. The Yoki in prison, you're pretty much just looking at rocks the entire time, and that goes double for the asteroid world. The sewers are also a visual nightmare. Oh yeah, and if you want an actual nightmare, go to Retroland and look at this. This might just be scarier than anything from any of the Silent Hill games, but uh, yeah, the presentation's good here and there, like the music and the uh, and the menus and stuff, but overall, it looks just okay. Good game though, like honestly, that was a really nice surprise, I wish I had that thing when I was a kid. Next up, Jimmy Neutron vs. Jimmy Negatron, also by Humansoft. I already talked about this game in great detail in my Jimmy Neutron vs. Jimmy Negatron video, so I don't know, check that one out if you want to see more of this one in particular, but for this video I'll give you the abridged version with some fun new details as well. 
dope ass title screen music. Uh, one thing I didn't mention about this, when I first came back to this game last year, hearing this song blew my mind. I've had that bass riff living in my head rent free for over 15 years and I never had any idea what it was from. Like it would just come out of me if I ever needed a beat or a riff to do a joke off of or I was just humming to myself or anything like that. This song would just keep coming out of me and I didn't know why. So I popped this guy into this freaking thing for the first time in 80 years and it was from freaking this of all things. Mystery Salt, I guess. Anyway, so this was a Game Boy Advance counterpart to a weird standalone sequel to the original Jimmy Neutron PC game. It doesn't follow the same plot at all, it only reuses the same villain and then it just makes up a bunch of nothing scenarios just so there's levels to play. And yeah, it's a 3D platformer with tank controls, which sounds terrible, but uh, if you hold down the L button you can lock the view and then jump freely diagonal and everything, so that helps a lot. While in the first Game Boy Advance game you played certain levels as Jimmy and certain levels as Goddard, here you just pick whoever you want, it doesn't matter, they're both exactly the same. In fact, you can just be Goddard the entire game if you want to, that's what I did when I was a kid. Once again, our weapon is the Shrink Ray, though uh, this time landing enough hits will eliminate the enemy completely instead of just temporarily stunning them. Ammo for the thing is a bitch and a half to find, however. You'll have to ration your ammo and make shots count in this thing more than a freaking Resident Evil game. I'm not even joking, like, unless you want to get stuck using this pea shooter that, yes, you can only fire this quickly, that's as fast as it goes, and, and you'll have to take out 10 enemies in some levels. There will be stages where you have to do this, and it is agonizing. At its best, it can be a kind of fun 3D platformer with some pretty fun shooting, but at its worst, it is a frustrating slog that sucks ass and has nightmare-inducingly nonsensical graphics. Like, what is any of this supposed to be? Don't come near me! Pretty cool main menu though. I love that it's Jimmy's giant computer screen with all the options on it and he swerves around to go to different things. The comments from Jimmy are weirdly offbeat? I don't know, is that the right word? Like, what is this supposed to be? Go, 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 winky face. Please press the A button. Can you please come play with me? Huh? <laughs> this is my teacher. She tries to teach me again, winky face. She tries to, she tries to teach, she tries to teach me again? What does that mean? I don't know, is it supposed to be like, oh, I'm too smart, I'm a genius, I already know all this elementary school stuff, oh, <laughs> teacher, she tried to teach me again, I already know, or is it, I don't know, is it supposed to be like, uh, what's relatable to kids? Uh, kids don't like school, oh, watch out kids, those teachers, they'll try to teach you. <laughs> what does this mean? Like, what does he mean by that? I actually haven't stopped thinking about this line since I made that other video, it's like, it's like actually kept me up at night. And the best part is, is there's more text in this bubble, so they had to make the wiki face smaller this time so it would all fit. I need to stop playing this. What do we got next? Okay, uh, Jet Fusion. The console version was pretty mediocre. It was mostly okay, I guess, you know, had some fun gadgets and stuff, but there's some really annoying difficulty spikes in there and some clunky mechanics, too. I wonder if the Game Boy Advance version will be any better. Okay, you, 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 yeah. Helix, he likes, who's this? Okay, they were a mid-2000 subdivision of THQ, website no longer active, and yeah, definitely not around anymore. What am I talking, THQ's not even the same company anymore, of course they're not around anymore, but they were a branch of the old THQ back in the day that did tons of licensed games. They did Pixar, Nickelodeon, Scooby, even Star Wars. Mostly Game Boy Advance games, but towards the end of the studio's lifespan, they did make a couple of DS games as well. One of the company founders even worked on Rayman Hoodlum's Revenge for the Game Boy Advance. That's something I still gotta make a video about someday. Really not much a title screen. This is probably the most low effort one so far. Oh good, passwords again, great. Nickelodeon really seemed to cheap out on those cartridge batteries. That's three for three now that don't have a save feature. Ah, oh, whatever, let's do a new game. The story opens up at Retroville Elementary. Uh, Jimmy's got a book report due, so he invents this device that can scan the contents of the book and project it into a live movie adaptation right away. The Virtual World Reproduction Machine. But obviously that's not what happens. No, it instead goes haywire and turns the entirety of Retroville into a spy movie, complete with pirates, ninjas, and cool spy guy, not James Bond, Jet Fusion. 
all of this is not what happens in the show at all, not even close, but weirdly enough, it's the exact same not what happens in the show that happens in the PS2 version of the game. And that means this version of the story must have been written up by like some producer or something that didn't even read the original episode script and instead just made up some random shit and sent it off to multiple game developers. I mean, I'm not gonna pretend like I know how all this stuff works and what happened, but like, I don't know, that's my estimated goofy guess. So for this game, instead of adapting the 3D look into sprites, they went for a more 2D cartoony look, uh, sort of like when you see Jimmy Neutron in uh, Fairly Odd Parents. And it looks okay, sprites all look fine, but uh, some of the full screen story art really isn't very flattering. You've seen Potato Neutron, you ready for Peanut Neutron? Jet Fusion comes up to Jimmy out of nowhere for no reason, and Jimmy's like, wow, you're cool, Jet Fusion! And Jet Fusion's like, Jimmy, we have to stop Professor Calamitous! And that's the whole plot, really. It's, it's just an abridged version of what happens in the console game. Though instead of being locked away, waiting to be saved at the end of the game, he'll actually meet up with you many times throughout. Gameplay is another side-scroller, Jimmy's got a laser blaster that he can aim in all eight directions this time, though aiming it diagonally is kind of weird. Pressing the L button aims diagonal up, but you have to press down afterwards to aim diagonal down. And that wouldn't be a problem if it didn't make the camera whip all over the frickin' place. I'm just trying to shoot at guys, show me the guys I'm trying to shoot at. Why is this camera so freaking sensitive? I guess it is pretty good at always showing you where you're trying to go, but man, it has the opposite problem the first game's camera did. It's way too fast. It'll snap into place whenever you push a direction on the D-pad so suddenly, making it whip back and forth. It can be disorienting sometimes. As for the gameplay itself, well, yeah, you're shooting guys and you're jumping on platforms. It is painfully simple. There's really barely anything to it. You'll just mow down rows and rows of the exact same enemy over and over and over as you make incredibly simple jumps. Every level takes place in the same settings as they did in the console version, with the exception of the first and final levels. The ninja, jungle, and pirate theme levels all make an appearance, but the school level featured in the console version's intro is skipped entirely, tackling the ninja level right out of the gate instead. Final level is also different. Instead of the communications tower in the desert, here we have a space station. Congrats, Jimmy! You made it to Professor Calamitous's orbital space station! I have no idea how we got here. The previous level was on Earth, and I didn't see a spaceship anywhere. Other than those two, everything else is more or less the same, with the same enemy designs as well, including the ninjas, the ultra lords, the pirates, and even the uncomfortable caveman depiction of natives. Jesus Christ, this game straight up has you going into native villages and slaughtering the shit out of them. Like, guys, you could have pointed at anything in the entire jungle to be like, okay, uh, here's the Goomba, you kill a hundred of these things and you picked natives. You think it would have made more sense that he was like, I don't know, tackling a hidden spy base in the jungle and fighting spies or something? Like, I get that they're holograms, right? But you have to remember, this is an adaptation of the book. Like, it's just the implication that in that book, Jet Fusion goes into a village and kills a bunch of innocent people to get a coconut at the top of the hill. No, no, that's, that's literally why you're doing this, is to get a coconut up there. You really couldn't have just found one down there? But anyway, when Jimmy isn't being Super Hitler 2, he's unlocking new abilities for Goddard and new gadgets to navigate the environments with in different ways. The Goddard Copter has you standing in place, double tapping up on the D-pad to activate, and then you can do a big old jump. Definitely would have preferred a version of this that flows a bit better. I hate they have to stop and double tap up, but I guess it's not terribly difficult to pull off quickly once you get used to it. It doesn't really add a whole lot though. You just kind of do it every time a platform is slightly further or slightly higher, like you just read it and do the appropriate action. I feel like you could have done more interesting things with this. I mean, sometimes you're bouncing off of bubbles with it and that's kind of cool, but they usually only do it in the most going through the motions way possible, if that makes sense. The other Goddard power is a bit more contextual. It's the Goddard Submarine. This allows Jimmy to move underwater freely. Uh, he's usually buoyant and just floats to the top. You can't dive by yourself, but with this thing, you can move all around freely and even shoot underwater. No idea I was breathing underwater. What am I talking about? I have no right to wonder that because he can breathe in space. I guess it is still a Y, but it's it's not a new Y. Some of the gadgets are kind of cool. I like this water blaster that cools lava rocks in the platforms and also can douse those magma monster mans. Strangely enough though, you don't actually invent any of the gadgets. Jet will just show up randomly and give it to you. I think I need a ladder to get up there. I don't have a ladder, but you can take this gumball blaster. Why would he have that?
Oh, I was, yeah, I was gonna say, like, how is that equivalent to a ladder? <laughs> That's actually kind of cool. In the console version, this would turn you into Super Monkey Ball, which you can't do here, but you actually fire the thing, like, six times in the whole game there, just to clog gears. That is at least a little bit more interesting here. You'll instead fire rapidly at the walls to create these little gumball ledges that you're able to climb up to. I thought this was really cool. It's a lot of fun to play with, but unfortunately, you kind of get it on the very last level, so you barely get to use it before the game's over. I really wish you got to use it more. You can also find power-ups for the standard blaster, each one gradually making the rays wider, more plentiful, and bouncier. It's one of those games where you start with a tiny little pea shooter that slowly becomes a weapon of mass destruction. It's actually pretty satisfying upgrading the thing. And that was enough to make me actually go for the off-beaten pathways I'd keep seeing on the map. But as fun as it can be blasting through the enemies and having the cool little occasional gadget thing, it does all get old really fast. That's all you do from the beginning of the game, and it never really gets all that more interesting. There's a map, but every level is a straight frickin' line. It might curve a little bit here and there, and it might look like there's a bit of exploration, but it's always just a linear off-beaten path to a power-up, and then it's back to the painfully linear and sometimes winding level filled with repetitive gameplay. At the end of each world, Jimmy will then have enough invention parts to create whatever he needs to advance, just like in the console game, but uh... If you thought the inventions didn't make much sense there, oh buddy, they make even less sense here. In fact, this one makes so little sense, it makes Looney Tunes look like frickin' science. Okay, are you, ready? are you ready to know what you do here? Jimmy has to build a pachinko machine by this door, and then he has to play the pachinko machine and get a high score on it, and then the door opens. No explanation as to how, or why, or what? <laughs> what? It is, like, it is so transparent to me that the design document must have asked them to make mini games or something. You know, the console version of the same thing, right? So they were probably like, oh shit, I guess we have to do that. And then they just shoehorn them in as lazily as possible. <laughs> I can practically hear the chatter in the room, like, Oh crap, we need minigames. Um, I, I know how to program a simple pachinko machine, I did that once before. Oh cool, yeah, I, I can make a rhythm game. I I've done that before too, yeah, I can make one of those. It really seems like it was just kind of like whatever they could make. I mean, I got the same vibes from the minigames and Attack of the Twonkies, but at least the arcade setting made the context make sense. But no, they gave us a game where Jimmy Neutron invents a pachinko machine you have to beat in the jungle in order to open a door. But what's he gonna do next? Invent a toothbrush you have to rub on a leaf in France to open your microwave. Okay, the next one does make sense. It's not a random mini game. No, you invent a missile that you have to guide all the way through a winding maze. Kind of annoying, but kind of fun. It's okay. Took me a couple of tries. The last one has you throttling the Jimmy bot through this maze. It's similar, but it has different controls. You'll rotate the jetpack with the D-pad and press the A button to propel yourself in that direction, uh, just like asteroids. This one's a lot more annoying than anything. Slowly and clunkily getting yourself through this dumb maze. I just wanted it to be over. Boss fights are all pretty similar to the console version, but of course being in 2D, we've got the Ultra Lord Sheen, the Mermaid Cindy, uh, though instead of fighting the Shaman Miss Fowl, we instead get a gorilla version of Carl. Carl's in this, that's interesting. He was completely absent from the console version, despite having artwork of him unlockable in the game. I see, I, I wonder if this is where that ended up going. The final boss is Professor Calamitous, as you probably guessed. It's pretty fun using the copter to get over him as he goes back and forth, but once you've solved the simple attack pattern, you can beat him in less than a minute. Some final boss. Pretty cool that Jet Fusion fights alongside you, though. You gotta take out the legs, and you wait for Jet to kick him in the head, and then you get the fire at the weak point. That's cool. The entire point of the TV special was to give kids that fantasy of living up to the legend and working side by side with your favorite hero. So I, I thought it was really silly how they don't do that in the PS2 game. They just lock him away and boil him down to a MacGuffin. So it was really cool seeing them actually attempt to do something like that here, even if it was pretty brief and only at the end. Not really much an ending, though. It's just Jet congratulating Jim on saving the day, and then it's the credits. Final verdict. Well, if I had this game when I was a kid, probably would have liked it enough to beat it once, maybe during a long car ride, but I don't think I would have touched it again after that. It is painfully mediocre. Less frustrating than the console version, but equally as less interesting. All right, well, I guess we got one left, Attack of the Twonkies. Now, the console version of this is easily the best Jimmy Neutron game there is. Its faithfulness to the show with its on-point writing and very accurate environments make it a really great interactive version of Retroville. Any Jimmy Neutron fan's gonna be a kid in a candy store playing this thing, let me tell you. As for the Game Boy Advance version, well, let's see if it can hold a candle to it. 
Tantalus. That sounds super familiar. That's that's the studio that Nintendo got to make the Twilight Princess and Skyward Sword remasters. I'll be dumped right out of my ass. That's super random. Tantalus in Australia has a great track record for support. I remember watching this Nintendo Direct live and hearing Reggie say that. And you know what I did? I was, I was like, what is their track record? So I looked it up and you know what I saw? Funky Barn 3D. The further back you go with these guys, the more you start to see portable versions of licensed games, including Attack of the Twonkies for Game Boy Advance. I wonder if this one will be part of their great track record. Oh, that menu looking sharp! It's Jimmy's computer once again, just like in Jimmy Negatron, but it is a much cleaner version of it. It's a lot easier to understand and navigate this time, too. Now, unlike Jet Fusion, this one actually follows the plot of the TV episode. We start up with Jimmy preparing for his journey to the Comet Twonkis 3, and when we're first handed the rain, we're in Jimmy's house looking for everything we need. Well, we gotta see what Jimmy's room looks like in this one. E yo, the door doesn't open. You just go right through it. Visuals could be better. I mean, it looks okay, you know, like the dodgy backgrounds aside. The sprites look decent enough. They do look kind of smudgy on the actual little screen, though. As for the controls, well, Jimmy only walks if you push the D-pad in either direction. You gotta double tap to make him run, and that got really annoying after a while, especially when you're just trying to jump off a tiny platform and, you know, you only go far if you're running. Never had a problem double tapping to run and stuff like Kirby, but I guess those games have actually good controls. Here, they're clunky as all hell. If you try to jump during the landing animation, the inputs don't register. So like every couple of jumps, you hit the button and he doesn't jump and you have to hit it like one or two more times and then he jumps and it's like, it never really gave me a difficult time, but it sure didn't make the game feel very good to play. Anyway, after another one of those spaceship mini games, it's uh, pretty much the same thing as in the movie game, except slightly different. We then get to Twonkus 3. We then get to the end of this ridiculously short level with barely anything in it, and at the end is that big Twonky throwing boulders at Jimmy's rocket, just like the show. And this is where I got stuck. I had no idea what to do here. Like, what did, what did he say? I let myself die just to read that again because I could not figure out what to do. Well, okay, my baseball training should come in handy. What does that mean? Do I need to, do I need something to throw? Do I need a bat? That could mean I need a projectile or a melee thing. So I don't know. I looked around the level to see if I missed anything to make an invention or find an item or something like that. But no, there's nothing here. I combed the whole thing. There's nothing here. After fiddling around, I found some Goddard commands. That's a thing in this version. Okay, cool. We got a step makes Goddard into a platform. Okay, okay, okay. beware. I'm guessing that's an attack. That's not doing anything. Okay, play dead. That's got to work. Hmm, I made Goddard explode over and over and over and nothing happened. I, I used the beware command over and over and over and nothing happened. I couldn't even tell if I'm doing damage or not, like there's no response at all. I had to look it up and you know what you do? You apparently have this slide move if you press B while running. I didn't even know you could do that, but did the game tell me I could do that? Did the game say, hey Jimmy, press B while running to slide into the Twonky? No, it said baseball training. That's not what I think of when I think of baseball. I'm thinking of like bats and balls and throwing and catching stuff. I mean like, sure, I guess sliding's a component in there somewhere, I guess. But like, what a bizarre way to try to convey that information to me, you know? Like, what were they thinking? Like, oh, kids are stupid. You gotta make tutorials fun. What's fun for kids? Kids like baseball? What are you talking about baseball for? Just tell me what freaking buttons I need to hit, please. All right, I finally beat the big guy and Jimmy returns back to Earth. No minigame this time. The first one is the only time you ever control that rocket. Why did they think that would look good? They could have just not done anything to the mouths and it would have it would have worked. But somebody just had to be, hey, I have an idea. <laughs> Let's animate the mouths. Why? There's no sound coming out of it, dude. <laughs> it's text. I can read, dude. I don't read the, I can't read his lips. It, it's, I'm reading bub, 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 bub. From here on out, the game pretty much ditches the plot to have Jimmy run around to random parts of Retroville and collect some Twonkies. It was following the console version of the plot, kinda, but at a point it just becomes video game levels with barely any excuse to why you're even there. Other than again, just, hey Jimmy, get the Twonkies. They're here now, go here now. You can tell they just made up random shit just to have levels. I mean, out of nowhere, there's a random subplot of a Twonky shrinking Jimmy with the shrink ray, and then we have to find a way to get back to normal size. And we end on another Mode 7 flight stage, this time riding in a toy airplane around Jimmy's lab. It it's functionally the exact same as a rocket, speed up, speed down, shoot everything, that's about it. But uh, it it's fine as a quick diversion, and it's kind of interesting that they made a whole second like skin for this same minigame. This is pretty much the only time in the whole game that the plot isn't just get all the Twonkies, and the funniest part is, 
you do not have to grab any of the Twonkies. At a point, I started running by 90% of them and the game didn't care, so why should I? I'm not getting those things, you get them. The only thing you have to get are the invention parts. Trying to finish a level without them all will have one of Jimmy's friends tell you to head back and grab it. Similarly to the console version, you're able to collect a lot of random objects and then turn them into inventions through this menu here. Though unlike the console version, it is completely void of anything that made it fun to engage with. Firstly, you just kinda get them. Like, there's no attention drawn to each individual item when you pick it up. You don't get a chance to consider the context and utility of the object. There's no scrolling through a menu and freely deciding which things you want to combine. Instead, you pick it up and that's it. You don't even have to think about what you even picked up. Don't let this menu fool you. It's really just a checklist. The whimsy of inventing things with Jimmy completely replaced with keep getting the red things and you'll get the next item. The inventions themselves range from, you know, operating as expected, to being completely useless. Firstly, there's the vacuum, you know, just for sucking up all the Twonkies, of course. Uh, there's no tug of war or anything, no input to make the action engaging or anything. You just hold down B and the game will give it to you. The Sheenograph doesn't sound anything like Sheen. The setup for it was really mishandled, too. Did they even try? Did they even know why this item, like, does what it does? Like, look at this. Sheen's like, I tried singing the Ultra Lord theme song to my Twonky, and he really didn't like it. Okay, so firstly, bullshit. Sheen's horrible singing is the only thing the Twonkies like. That's the entire reason we're using the CD of his voice. It calms them back to their small forms. Getting that plot detail wrong makes it sound like we don't want the CD. The other inventions are mostly all optional stuff. I mean, well, they're not optional to get, you have to get everything, but they're optional to use. The only one you really need a lot is the shrink ray. You can temporarily shrink enemies, which renders them harmless for a short while. You can also use it to shrink down any sources of music that would evolve any unchecked twonkies into stompers and crumps. What are these sound effects? It really sounds like they just slapped random sound effects on these objects in two seconds. Why is this fire hydrant making harp sounds? Hey, let's play a game. Hey, what does this sound like? What, what should this thing sound like? An alarm? A speaker? An intercom? No, it's pinball. Hey, Brady, what does pool sound like? Bowling. I found out later that you can also blow these things up permanently with Goddard's Play Dead move, which is the only thing I've been able to even find that you can do with Goddard in this game. I went the whole game, like aside from blowing like two or three of these up, I went the whole game without using him at all. <laughs> I thought it was underutilized in the console version. Good God, at least I used him more than this. I could say the same for 90% of the inventions too. I barely used any of them. Uh, like the confusion ray, yeah, like it confuses enemies, renders them harmless, but so does the shrink ray. Okay, so that's useless. I'm never gonna need that. What does this guy do? Disguise. Oh, I'm the Twonky, dude. I'm the, I'm the freaking and talky. You can do this on any enemy in the game, and it's, you know, it's kind of fun for a few seconds, but it doesn't take long to realize that you can't really do anything as any of these characters, so I... Okay, that was fun, but I guess I'm done with that. Sprinter? Well, you'd think that would be shoes that make you run faster, but they're actually shoes that make you jump a bit higher. Never found anywhere I really needed them at all, though. The standard double jump pretty much clears everything and anything. The last thing you get is the jetpack, which you need for one of the bosses, but otherwise you never need to use this thing. Noticing a trend here, aren't we? Most of the inventions were also useless in the console version too, but they were at least still fun to make and look at once each there. Like, it had a whimsy to it. You're inventing stuff and thinking, about it. Here, not so much. You just pull it out, you find out it's useless, and you put it away. And I guess the disguise, you know, kind of comes close to giving you that feeling, but even then, I didn't get the experience of finding the three things and thinking of how they could be applied before getting to excitedly put them together. That's what I think is the missing link here. And I guess the only thing left to talk about are the boss fights. So, uh, once again, each one is an elemental twonky, but, uh, they're not terribly interesting. If there's a degree of puzzle involved, it's usually just you hitting all the buttons and then hitting him. You really don't need a brain blast to figure these out, that's for sure. The final boss is just like the console version, it's that super twonky that shifts between all of the prior elemental twonky boss fights as uh, several different forms. And yeah, it's the same as the console version of the boss, they just copy and paste all the previous forms into a new arena. The only difference here is that they're not as fun to beat, and uh, it takes a lot longer too, so it's even more annoying that you have to refight them all in this version. After the Twonkies toast, we get one final crunchy as hell screenshot of Jimmy and the gang celebrating, and then we get the credits. Wait, that was- no, go back, go back. That's Cindy's old design again?! Dude, we're at the very end of this Jimmy Neutron shit and they hit us with this one last time at the very last second. 
And the weirdest thing is, is that they were using the correct design throughout the entire game. Both of the other scenes with Cindy in it depict her with the correct model, including the scene that literally happens right before the boss fight, implying, I guess, that she changed hairstyles and clothes while Jimmy was fighting the final boss? You know what, I'm also just realizing now that every time you see her sprite in a level, it's also her old design too. So then why do they have her correct design in every cutscene except the last one? Where did this picture even come from? Were the other scenes given to them by people working on the show and maybe they needed one last one that they didn't get in time and they had to have it quickly made for them by the console devs using their weird Cindy model? God, I really didn't expect this rabbit hole of them using Cindy's wrong design all the time in the video games to get deeper and deeper all the way to the bitter end. Well, that's that. Uh, yeah, I guess it gets points for being the only one in the series with a save feature actually included a battery in this cartridge, but... Honestly, it's the worst one. Well, that's sort of ironic. The console version is objectively the best Jimmy Neutron game by a mile. The Game Boy Advance version, not so much. It kind of sucks a lot, actually. Like, it's just as repetitive as Jet Fusion on Game Boy Advance, but like, the controls are so much worse. They're so stiff. Just getting around in this game is annoying to do. I guess the gadgets are kind of cool sometimes, but again, they barely utilize them whatsoever. I think out of every Jimmy Neutron game I played on Game Boy Advance, this is the one I can easily say I had the least amount of fun with. Okay, I kinda have one more. I found a cartridge that just says Jimmy Neutron without Boy Genius. It's probably just the first game, but I figured we'd check that real quick. Okay, it is just the first game. Well, why is the label different? Oh my god, I should have known that. The answer's right there. <laughs> it also explains why you have to pick a language when you start. Well, since I apparently have two copies of this thing, why don't we check out the multiplayer, buddy? That's right, this thing had a multiplayer mode that I completely skipped because, well, I thought I wasn't gonna be able to play it. Looks like I was wrong about that, buddy. Let's check this out and see what the multiplayer for this thing even looks like. Oh my god, I forgot you can't plug that into this thing. Well, the only other way I can record Game Boy Advance stuff is through that thing. Only got S video for the GameCube, so excuse the dumber than usual video quality. Thank god you can actually use this thing to play multiplayer. It's really treated the exact same as a regular old Game Boy Advance. In fact, you can even plug it into another GameCube if you really want. Okay, let's pick multiplayer on both devices. All right, why, why is this one player one? Oh right, that's how it worked back then. Player one was just whoever plugged in the frickin' blue side. All right, you ready for some Jimmy Tutron player? We got uh, two modes, there's platform and race. Why don't we start with platform? What, Jimmy cloned himself to play. Okay, if by play you mean just like actually kill each other, then uh, maybe. It mostly controls the same as the main game. You're just plopped into a map and you gotta shoot each other and you drop coins that way and the first to pick up enough of them is the winner. Not a whole lot more to it than that. It's kind of like the coin mode in Smash. You can grab better weapons and switch to them with this menu. That's the only thing I think here is different from the main game. And there's three level types, which really only changes the background, all of which just recycle backgrounds with a single player as expected, and you can make the map either small, medium, or large. Geez, the large maps are way bigger than I expected. This honestly might even be way too big for four players, but I only have two carts, so I wasn't able to test that. The other game mode is just the spaceship minigame again, except you're racing your friends. Again, not much to it. You can go through these rings to speed boost and shoot at your friends to slow them down, and that's about it. Skill ceiling very low. If you get ahead, it's very difficult for the other people to catch up. I do really love how they make up a brand new excuse as to why there's four Jimmy Neutron every game. Sometimes he cloned himself, sometimes the Yokians cloned him, sometimes it was a time warp. No idea why they felt the need to explain why the video game multiplayer has more than one Jimmy, but it is kind of cute in a fun way. Humansoft also included multiplayer games in Jimmy Negatron as well, and while I can't play most of them due to only owning one copy of the game, unfortunately, there is one of them that single pack play that we can check out. Some GBA games had this thing where you'd plug in an empty Game Boy and you turn it on on, and player 1's GBA would temporarily load just the necessary data into the other GBA's RAM, just like when you download a little minigame from a GameCube game. And it's just asteroids. You pick one of the four characters, you fly around, shoot meteors, and the first to collect enough gems is the winner. You know what, I actually remember playing this exactly one time when I was a kid with a friend, back when the GBA was still new and we were just seeing what games we could play together with the link cable, and yeah, we really thought nothing of it even back then as kids, and we went straight back to playing Mario Bros. 
Though I could totally see myself playing around with this one a lot as a kid if I had it. There's not much to it, but at least you're going around and jetpacking and shooting each other, and that's definitely a lot more fun than the other minigames. I mean, that's all the DK64 multiplayer ever was, and I love the crap out of that as a kid. Okay, one last bonus one, just because I've always been really curious about what this thing looks like. So, uh, for those that don't know, back in the day, they would put, like, a couple of episodes of shows on the Game Boy Advance cartridges for some reason. Now, Game Boy Advance plays more than games. It's got TV shows, too. I don't know. When I was eight years old, I thought that was stupid, but that was the time, I guess. You know, tech was limited, and media devices could only really play a minuscule amount of content displayed at an incredibly low resolution. There was no modern phones, no iPods. I mean, hell, the PSP wasn't even out yet. There wasn't really anything you could just drop an MP4 on. Video now, video then, video why. Our four episodes of Jimmy Neutron on Game Boy Advance. Who knows? Who cares? Let's just see what it looks like. I'm not using the game- Oh, not compatible with the Game Boy Player. What, like... This thing here? It wouldn't work on that? Why? Now I want to see what happens if you, like, put it in there. Oh, it just freezes up on that. I don't know what I expected. Uh, they probably did this to avoid showing people just how garbage the video quality is, which makes sense. You blow it up to a big screen and you can really see that. But too bad, suckers, I got a DS capture card. We're blowing that shit up anyway and I'm showing everybody how bad this looks. It's not even a video game, but there's a title screen. And we got four episodes. There's Brobot, The Big Pinch, Granny Baby, and Time is Money. So that's about, what, 44 minutes of content? Dude, that's not even a movie. Man, oh man, if the actual video quality wasn't crunchy enough, they technically have even crunchier versions right here. Yeah, let's blow that up. Ooh, that looks good. Okay, no, the actual thing looks a bit better than this. Selecting an episode gives us the player controls. Okay, and oh, there it is. Jimmy Neutron, the animated series in gloriously compressed 32-bit video. The audio quality sucks ass. It's awesome. Uh, do you want to play some baseball? We can use Goddard as a pitching machine. The D-pad will fast forward and rewind. Uh, not very quickly, mind you. Chapter selection is done with the shoulder buttons. That's how you'll really scrub through these things. Uh, and then you pause with the start button, and you can adjust the brightness with the A and B buttons. Oh, that's such a relic of the past. Uh, the GBA didn't originally have a backlight, so games would often just have brighter than usual graphics to try to be more visible in the thing. So I guess this makes sense here, but I really couldn't imagine any Anybody wanting to watch a version of Jimmy Neutron as blown out as this, let alone as bit crushed as this. Now I'm sure you guys are thinking, well this has to look better on the actual little screen. I mean that happens a lot with GBA stuff, right? Well it's obviously better looking, but the compression is still rather noticeable, the colors are still washed out, and the frame rate is still visibly chopped in half. At least scenes with darker colors and more limited palettes often come across a little bit better than the more colorful scenes, but it all still looks pretty bad even on the little screen. It's a really weird thing that existed, and judging from the fact that they never made a Volume 2 despite putting Volume 1 on the label of this one, I think that says a lot about how well these things sold. I mean, if I could tell four episodes at low quality was a ripoff when I was a kid, I'm sure most other kids could too. And anybody who did buy one probably wouldn't buy another after seeing how shit it was. I may have bought the e-reader when I was a kid, but even I had the sense not to bother with this. It is a really cool thing going back to as an adult though, you know, you're like you're watching this device that you spent years playing Mario and Frogger on, and you're seeing it struggle to figure out how to process the Jimmy Neutron show. Well, and I guess that just about does it. Yeah, the only one I'd really recommend to Jimmy Neutron fans is Jimmy Neutron, the first one. <laughs> uh, it's like surprisingly well designed. The gameplay's fun, the level design's pretty cool. Totally decent side-scrolling video game, that one. But uh, Jimmy Neutron vs. Jimmy Negatron, on the other hand, I wouldn't really recommend as much to everybody. It's kind of weird and clunky and difficult and annoying, but I think it does have somewhat of a speed game appeal, so I think there are people out there that will find the thing kind of cool. Jet Fusion's easily the zombie game of the bunch. It functions well enough, like the controls are fine, it's playable, but it is really mindless and really repetitive. Not at all challenging or engaging whatsoever. It can be okay, I guess. Like, 
It's the sort of thing I would have called it offensive at worst if, at its worst, it wasn't being offensive. Surprisingly, Twonkies was the worst one of the bunch. It felt so rushed together, dude. Most of the abilities are worthless, Goddard's completely useless, the level design's bland and unengaging, the controls are poop, and there is zero point in collecting the Twonkies. It has been interesting seeing how similar most of these games are, though. They may all feel quite different from each other, with the physics being different each time, but the side scrollers do all have the same basic moveset, even down to crawling through those narrow passages. However, they all couldn't look any different. Each one adapts the show's 3D style in a completely different way. If any of them are actually worth playing, it's the first one. But uh, yeah, either way, I can now officially say I've beaten every single Jimmy Neutron video game. Good job, James. <laughs> but if I ever play any more Nickelodeon platformers, it'll be the Attack of the Power Juju games. I know I'm long overdue for those guys, but uh, I think for now I'm going to tackle some independent 3D platforming stuff that's not nailed down to a big series. So uh, yeah, thank you, Jimmy, for being a cool, inspiring young lad with a big old brain that gave me many, many memories. Thank you for having a bunch of cool and interesting video games for me to talk about. And uh, of course, most of all, thank you guys for watching me talk about them. Take care. Yo, welcome to the end of the video. Thank you a lot for watching this one. It was really long and took me forever to do. Um, if you like what I'm doing here and you do want to support the channel, I do have a $1 podcast up on Patreon.com. And if you don't care about that, I got way more videos on similar topics. Um, I ain't going to tell you what to do. You do what you will with that info.